All right, let's start with the webinar. Uh, this webinar is about uh, the treatment of open fractures in the low resource settings. My name is Tom Hendricks. I will be your host of today. I'm a global health doctor and I've worked in Tanzania and I'm part of Global Surgery Amsterdam. Um, we have several presentations today. And the content today is first an introduction by Dr. Botman. We, who will introduce uh, the open fractures and uh, uh, will show how big the problem is. Dr. Haasnoot will uh, show the technique of external fixation. Uh, then we have a questionnaire. We will uh, discuss the questionnaire together. Uh, we will ask you to share your vision about access to external fixation. And you will find an email in your inbox. I just sent you an email now with the questionnaire and we will look to it uh, in a few uh, minutes. Then Dr. Bodman will, in, will discuss four local flaps to cover bone defects. And uh, at last, we also have a Q&A. You can send questions to my email address, which is uh, here below, but you can find the email because I've sent you just an, uh, uh, my, my email with the questionnaire. So the first um, uh, presentation will be an introduction to open fractures by Dr. Bodman. Yes, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the, this first webinar of Global Surgery Amsterdam. Um, we're really happy that we are able to use this technique uh, offered by Icoplast, and uh, that we can use the Zoom account to distribute, to share knowledge worldwide, together with everybody who is able to find some internet somewhere to, to connect and to discuss this uh, important topic. Um, the, one of the... Uh, one of the main uh, ideas behind Global Surgery Amsterdam is that we want to aim for one world, one standard of care. And uh, in trauma care, uh, the standard of care in different countries is uh, absolutely not on the same level. So there are so many countries that are very much behind. But even in the developed countries, the, the funds for research and improvement of trauma care is far behind uh, uh, the, the funds that are available for infectious diseases, for example. Um, the first slide that you can see, the need for trauma care worldwide, shows this, uh, uh, yeah, this problem very clearly. You see that injuries cause almost 6 million deaths per year, while HIV, malaria, uh, and TB together uh, cause only 4 million deaths per year worldwide. Uh, so the injury is bigger, the injury problem is bigger than HIV, TB, malaria combined. But if you see the amount of money that is only spent on this problem in the US global funds, then it's uh, 1,073 million US dollars per year for infectious diseases and only 33 million for the injuries. So there's a very, very big gap between the two. And then you need to think about the fact that for every dead person because of an injury, there are three people disabled. So actually this problem is three times bigger because this, uh, this, 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 this big group of people that become disabled by injuries is a, is a disaster. There are often young, young people that are still have to take care of a family or, uh, or their, their, their children, their, their, their relatives. And uh, this is an enormous uh, impact when they have an injury and they cannot be treated well. One of the uh, problems in injuries, of course, the, the, the road traffic accidents. And uh, yeah, we experienced in different places in the world that road accidents cause a lot of trauma. Here in our hospital in Amsterdam, we have many people with open fractures of the lower legs, but also in Congo and in Tanzania. I've seen uh, many of them. And I'm really happy that the teams of Congo and Tanzania are also joining because some of the cases we're going to discuss today, they come from their setting, because we're going to talk about the trauma care in that setting. But when I say that, I also want to, uh, to emphasize on the fact that if you talk about one world, one standard of care, that everybody, wherever he is in the world, should try to follow the best international guidelines that somebody can get. And you can 
in many places where you have internet, you can find these international guidelines for free. So you can know that you should know these guidelines and to use them and then choose the best treatment options for your patient in your circumstances and in your hands. If referral is possible, you can do referral, but if referral is not possible, you have to find how you can use the principles of these guidelines in the best possible way. And one of the good examples that you can use for open fractures is the uh, standards of, for the management of open fractures of the lower limb by the British Orthopedic Association that's freely available online. When you start to talk about open fractures, the first thing you should know is the Gustilio Anderson classification. It's pictured here on, the, on, on this um, slide very clearly. You have the grade one, two, and three, and grade three is divided in three subgroups. It's very good to know this uh, classification uh, or to look it up when you have a difficult um, open fracture because then you can make a decision what kind of care is needed. And in this, um, in, in this presentation, we're going to talk mostly about the grade three, the, the, the severe uh, open fractures where more damage is there than only the bone and a little bit of the skin, but there is often extensive soft tissue damage. Um, when you're confronted with bad uh, open fractures, you have to make decisions. And one of the decisions is whether to do an amputation or to do a reconstruction. And if you do a reconstruction, how to do this reconstruction. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, if you're uh, confronted with a patient with a fracture with exposed bone, one of the basic rules is to keep it as simple as possible what you do, but not too simple, because if you do not take time to really think about the best option for this patient, then you can make stupid mistakes. But it is not a very difficult, and we hope that we can explain that to you in this presentation. Um, it's always start with a good history and a physical examination. Is there functional damage? It's something you have to test. You have to ask the patient questions. You have to do specific tests to find out if nerves and blood vessels are still functioning, if tendons are still um, doing the job they should do. And in the beginning, you should be aware of the importance of infection control. Antibiotics should be given as, as early as possible. And then irrigation is very important to wash away all the dirt from the wounds. And then the next thing to do is to go to theater. You have a, made a very specific plan. What is the best for this patient? And then the first thing to do in theater is a surgical debridement, really prevent infection. What I said before is that we cannot always save the leg. So sometimes an amputation is the best debridement you can do because the tissue is so badly damaged that it cannot be preserved. Here you see a very bad case of an old open fracture with a lot of bone exposed. It is a difficult decision to do an amputation in a patient like this because the patient will probably refuse it in the beginning. And that's also understandable because without a leg, what can he do? Do you have options for an artificial leg? That's an important question to ask yourself before you do an amputation. Sometimes it's easy because you have a lot of blood loss and you have to save the patient in the acute phase. You have to do an amputation to, 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 to save this, this person. But sometimes, like in this case, you could have discussions with your colleagues, with, your, with the patient himself, and you have to make a very good plan and to, to, to take the family and the patient together in the decision. Here you see another example, and here it's maybe easier, especially for the right leg. This cannot be saved. And a very nice presentation, a, a, a nice performed amputation will be the best thing to do for this patient. Mm, the guideline, if you look at the guideline, when to do an amputation, they explain to you that you have to do it when there is an uncontrollable hemorrhage, when you have incomplete traumatic amputations, and when the distal remnant is very badly injured, you have no muscles functioning anymore, the nerves are not well, uh, and there is a very big piece of bone that is gone. And it's, especially when it's bigger than one third of the length of the tibia, you should consider to do an amputation. But if you have a bad injury and you have reduced plantar sensation at the initial presentation, this is not immediately an indication for amputation because the nerve can be crushed. It's not sure that it is completely dissected. So you, should, you could make the decision to give it a try to keep the leg even when the nerve is in the beginning not functioning. 
So the decision to amputate, I explained it already, it should be taken not by you on your own. You should try to find, to bring together the best consult the best persons if it's a surgeon or one of the medical doctors that is the most experienced in your team and then discuss it with the team and the and the patient and the family and then together you make the decision and if you can refer because you cannot make the decision yourself try to do that when you decide not to do an amputation you can think about a fixation and when you do the fixation early it's better than to delay it and that's shown in this slide because if you wait longer then the, re the risk of infection becomes bigger um, one of the possibilities is to use an external fixation we're going to, to talk about that and if you're not having an external fixation we will explain later in this presentation that you can also use the same principle of providing stability as much stability as possible after the reduction of the fracture and if you don't have then an external fixation you can also use a pop with a window for the wound but if you have an external fixation this is of course a, the better option because it gives more stability and more, and more easy access to the wounds to clean it if you have fixed the bone then the second step is to think about the healthy tissue the tissue that you need to cover the, the exposed bone because without uh, a good coverage of the bone, it will dry and it will probably uh, die and you have a bigger problem at the end. In dead situations, not the bone, but the soft tissue is often the biggest problem for the healing. In general, when we talk about fracture fixation, you know, the most basic option is to use a POP, a plaster of Paris, and that's good for close fractures with good reduction in most of the, most of the uh, situations where you have a fracture. But in open fractures, you have a higher complication rate uh, with infection, with delayed union, union. But if it is your own opsy, it is your own opsy. You have to try to, to, to deal with it. Sometimes you have even screws, plates, and nails available. But be aware of that. It is not easy at all to use that in a situation where you have an open fracture. It's always very good to think twice before you're going to start to use nails in very clean circumstances it is an option but you should be very experienced and, and, and be aware of the of the risk of infection because it is not easy to perform and the infection risk because of the hard metal that's inside the bone uh, is, is causing uh, when you have infection very bad problems for the future so the best option in in the uh, early stage when you receive a patient with an open fracture is the external fixation for the fixation it's quick and easy. You have less damage to blood supply. You have minimal interference with the soft tissue cover and wounds can be easily inspected and treated. The technique of the external fixation will be shown to you by uh, the resident trauma surgeon, Dr. Hasnout, who has also experienced as a global health doctor uh, in Sierra Leone. And I will uh, ask him to explain you about how to put your external fixation system in place. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Hasnout. I will continue this uh, webinar about the technique of external fixation. Um, I was introduced by Dr. Botman. Thank you very much. But now we will go into the more technical aspects of the external fixation, the technique. This here is an example of a complicated uh, fracture, a complicated open fracture, which is in need of fixation. Of course, a plaster of Paris would not be a good option here since there's uh, extensive soft tissue damage. Um, therefore, external fixation would be a good option. But how? Where do you start? Um, first of all, you need to be aware of the safe zones. Um, when you insert pins uh, for an external fixation, you need to be sure you don't um, cause any more damage to the nerves vessels you do not uh, in, in insert the pins in the joint capsules therefore there's safe sites you can find them in most uh, readily available books and also here on the right they are shown the femur on the lateral side and the tibia on the medial side have uh, safe zones where pins can be inserted it's also uh, of great importance not to damage any muscle and not to transfix it to the fracture what do you need if you're going to perform an external uh, fixation for a patient? 
of course, you need the open fracture, you need an OR, a uh, team, anesthesia. You also need x-ray to be sure that you uh, reduce the fracture uh, accept, uh, to an acceptable situation. You need to operate in a sterile field. And of course, you need the external fixation itself, which consists of pins, rods, clamps. You need a knife, you need a drill, you need a drill bit, and you also need a depth measurer in order to uh, put the pins in the correct depth. Um, so we'll discuss uh, the different parts of the external fixation a little bit more. It's actually quite simple. You need two, you need four pins for the uh, distal and the proximal uh, fragment of the fracture, and these need to be connected with via rods and the rods and the pins are connected through clamps. There's two types, pin to tube and tube to tube. We will go uh, more in depth about this uh, in the coming uh, slides. To start with the pins, there's a variety of diameters, lengths and designs of the pins. But the most important thing is to use a blunt pin because the blunt pins, if you drill them too deep through the bone, they will cause less damage than a sharper pin. So in general, it's, it's the best to first drill the hole and then insert a blunt pin. These pins need to be connected to the rods. This can be, these, these rods can be made of uh, all types of materials, for example, steel, aluminum, or carbon fiber. But the principle is that the more increased the diameter of the rod, the more stiff it is and the more strength it will provide for your construct. So usually simpler is better. Steel and aluminium have an advantage that they are stronger than carbon fiber, but they also show up on the x-ray, which makes it harder for you to assess whether you have a correctly reduced fracture. So these are the connecting rods. As I mentioned before, the increased diameter results in increased stiffness and strength, but be sure that you check um, that your clamps fit on the bars and on the pins before you start your operation. The diameter of the pins is also very important. If you use a too big diameter on the bone, you might induce another fracture as shown on the right side of the screen. So as a rule of thumb, you can use five to six millimeter pins for femur and tibia and smaller pins for the humerus forearm, hand and foot. But if you cannot un not remember that, you can always use a rule of thumb. One third of the di diameter of the bone should be the size of your pin. The clamps. On the right side of the screen, you see some examples of clamps. Some are more complicated than others. Um, but the most important thing you need to understand and need to remember is that single pin to bar clamps and bar to bar clamps are all you need. For example, on the right, you have a complicated multiple pin to pin system. You don't need it. What you need is single pin to bar and bar to bar. That's all you need. So here you see an example of the, the, basic, the basic needs you have for a simple external fixator. Four pins, two in each uh, different part of the fracture, the proximal and the distal part. These are connected by the pin to bar system which you then you use two bars and those bars you need to connect to each other to reduce the fracture. And then the last thing you need is something to tighten the, the clamps. So now we go on a bit more into the technique of the open fracture uh, treatment with external fixation. Here you see two blue um, bone fracture parts, which are not well aligned in this situation. They represent the proximal and distal part of the fracture. And this is what you want to, um, want, want, want to fix. And here you have one example where someone used a single bar, which is actually not a bar, and used it as a one bar system. And this is not a good system because it's very hard to get a proper reduction of your fracture. Furthermore, the bone is not covered by tissue, which means it will dry out and die. And then you will not, uh, this will not result in bone healing. As you can see here, this is an x-ray of the aforementioned single bar construct. You see the pins are too long, they're too close to the fracture, and also there is a fragment in the middle which is not connected, and the bone is not well aligned. So this will not result in, uh, in healing of the bone. Basically in this picture, everything has been done wrong, and at the end of this presentation you will know why and you will know how to do it. 
correctly. So a one bar system. This sounds like a very good plan because it sounds simple. You only need one bar, but there's actually quite a few pitfalls in this system. The first pitfall, which you, which you can uh, which 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 can happen, which is you, which one you just saw in that picture, is when the pins are put too close to the fracture, as shown here. They're very close to the fracture, and this has multiple disadvantages. And the the most important being, it's a very in, unstable system. Although it looks nice, it will result in an unstable fracture where the distal and the proximal part will not be aligned correctly. Furthermore. If you put the pins further away from the fracture, as shown in this picture, you have a good distance and this will result theoretically in a stronger construct. So this, would, this could be an option. So remember, always put the, the, the pins far away from each other. This will result in the biggest uh, stability. But there are more problems with the one bar system. As you can see here, the bones are now nicely aligned and the pins are put in place exactly in the middle in theory and then you put the one bar in and this this looks nice it should be all in the middle and it should result in this that the bars is perfectly aligned on the pins but in reality this it's very hard to um to put the pins precisely in the middle a more realistic um re result would be this the pins are they are kind of properly uh, placed not too close to the fracture so they should give stability but when you put on your bar it will be very hard because they're not exactly in the middle resulting in a bar which would would be crooked and then you still want to con connect the bar which will result in the in the, the proximal and distal parts of the fracture to be ill reduced as shown here so what could be a solution um to this one bar system also, if you if you uh, if there if the pins are not well aligned in a in a radial way, you can also get a, a improperly aligned fracture using the one bar, one bar system in this picture. The solution is a bar to bar system. In this way, it doesn't matter that much how your pins are inserted because you connect the proximal and distal part of the pins to one bar, then you align the fracture as shown here, and then you connect the two bars to each other, as shown here. This will result in a perfectly reduced fracture, although your pins might not be inserted absolutely perfect. But this will result in the biggest chance of a healing fracture. These, the bar in the middle is connected with the bar-to-bar -bar clamps. So this is a, a picture how, how that then would happen. Even if the pins are not inserted really perfectly, the bars connect to the pins and then one bar is used here to connect the two bars to each other this is the most realistic uh, way uh, to reduce a fracture with a uh, external fixation um, here you see an example of a bar to bar external fixation where the alignment is, has been done correctly as you can see the pins in the proximal uh, part of the fracture they are they are a bit crooked they are not precisely correctly inserted and that's also the case with the distal part, but using a bar-to-bar -bar technique, you do get perfect alignment of the fracture and a good, uh, a good chance for healing. So the post-operative care uh, for the pins is very important. They need to be cleaned twice a day um, and the clamps need to be tightened twice a week. Um, you can wait for the wound to heal and then you can consider a POP or you consider to, uh, to to, to let the fracture heal with the external fixator on for a longer time, period of time. The, the complications you can have uh, with an external fixation are numerous. You can have malunion or non-union. There can be tissue damage. You can have deep pin tract infections or infections in general. But uh, an external fixation, the infection, when it's in the wound, it usually does not go into the pin tracts if you have put them far enough away from the wound. Um, how to prevent pin tract infection. You need to have your pin insertion technique done correctly. This means you should stay away from the fracture because the fracture also has a hematoma, which you should not insert your pin into. So you should, you should stay at least three centimeters from the fracture. Um, that's a safe distance. 
um, you should all you should also um, be aware that you clean the the skin before you insert it and you should be aware of thermal necrosis this means you should, should drill slowly through the bone because if you drill too fast the bone gets too hot which leads to necrosis which also leads to your pins not being very strongly um, inserted into the bone this will not happen the first day but after a few days you will notice that the external fixation will come loose so you need to prevent uh, thermal necrosis so about the insertion technique of the pins you need you incise the skin you spread soft tissue and you use a sharp drill and it's very important to measure the depth and then to place the pin if you put the pin in too deep you can damage the the structures behind the bone which is not in the safe zone we mentioned in the earlier part of the presentation and once more the thermal necrosis is very important especially if you want to use this external fixation for a longer period to heal the, the bone for example four to six weeks you need to be sure you have no bone thermal necrosis so drill slowly um, to prevent malunion you need to make a good plan a preoperative plan you need to align the proximal and the distal part correctly. You need to check this with the x-ray. You can always, during the operation, uh, use the contralateral limb to compare if your rotation and length are correctly uh, reduced. Um, should malunion still uh, arise, in an early stage, you can correct this deformity by adjusting your, your um, fixed external fixation. Uh, but in a later stage, if you already have union of the bone, but in a, in, not in a correct um, uh, composition, then you should re consider reconstructive uh, osteostomy correction. Um, actually, in union rates are, are quite good uh, using the external fixation, um, and they can be minimized by avoiding distraction of the fracture site. Uh, using a stable and rigid construct, which we just discussed, using good surgical technique, which we also just discussed, uh, and when you control infections by cleaning the inserts of the pin twice a day and making sure you have a good debridement uh, prior to using your external fixation. Weight bearing in an uh, external fixation can be used if you have a very stable construct and that can actually lead to better bone healing. Um, just one more about the bar-to-bar -bar system. When you want to use a weight-bearing construct in an external fixation, what you can do, as, as shown in this picture, this is a bar-to-bar -bar system we just uh, discussed. You can also add a second bar. Then you get get a then you, you get an even stronger construct. You can put the bar in the between the first pins, like shown in this picture, or you can do it in any way you see fit. You connect them again with bar-to-bar -bar clamps. Um, this is, a, this is a, um, an example of a double bar, bar-to-bar -bar system, which can be used as a way to use a weight-bearing fixed external fixation. In this case, when there was an, uh, a fracture of the knee, where they decided to, to try to make the, the, whole, the whole leg weight-bearing and do an uh, osteo and um, uh, arthrodesis of the knee and in this situation the patient can actually wa walk use his leg to walk on it while it heals this is uh, the end of the technical part of the external fixation and i now give the the webinar back to tom thank you this is a, a more interactive part we would like uh, you to share your vision we want to know um, do you have access to external fixation uh, what are the problems you faced uh, using external fixation um, and we want to know this because we have uh, two students christian and maurits and they are developing uh, uh, an external fixation which is um, available and affordable for the low-income countries um, so we want to know more about external fixation do you face any problems and what are those problems but we will, um, we will enter the, the answers together. This will make it easier for some of you to know what to answer and what not. So I uh, sent you an email with uh, the questionnaire. If you click on the, the link, which is in the email, the questionnaire will be opened and we can fill it in together. 
So you will see on my screen, I'm going to fill it in and you can do it as well. Very important is if you are watching together with a colleague, please uh, answer uh, individually. So open on a laptop or on a phone and answer your uh, questionnaire individually. Don't do it together because then we have uh, less information uh, from you. Um, I'll give you a moment to open the, the questionnaires. And you will see on my screen, screen that you have to see this on your computer. So where to find it? You can find it in your email. I've sent you an email with the link. Click on the link, open the website, and then you will see this. So I'm slowly going to start answering. You have to fill in individually, please. Uh, so start with filling in your name. Then we want to know your email address. Where do you work? I'm working in Haidom, which is in Tanzania. Tanzania, I'll write here, so don't put it there. What is my function? I'm a resident. The size of our hospital, we have about 400 beds. Is there a working x-ray machine available in the hospital? We have it. So click yes if you have it, no if you don't. Do you have it in the operation room? Is there a working x-ray machine in the operation room? Can you use it during surgery? We have it in Haidom now. Question nine is how confident are you with the sterilization in your hospital? No confidence at all as one or more confident uh, to five. I'm quite confident four. When you've answered all the nine questions, you can click on next. If you missed one of the questions, it will not allow you to proceed. So please provide all answers, click on next. Then you will uh, arrive at the second page, question 10. So how big is this problem for you? How often presents a patient with an open fracture in this hospital? It doesn't matter how you treat it, but how often do you see? In Haidom, we see per month about three to five patients. Then question 11, how many of these patients are operated? Let's say one to two. Question 12 is, can you provide appropriate surgical treatment when needed? We have multiple answers you can provide us. Yeah, you, you have more uh, treatments available, you click yes, otherwise no, because lack of knowledge, because of lack of equipment, no, because of lack of time, no, because sterilization is unreliable, no, because patients can't afford the, the procedure. In Haidom, we can provide appropriate surgical treatments. So when you answer multiple answers are possible, then we go to question 13. What kind of fixation of open fractures of lower leg is available in your hospital? So how you, are you going to fix the fracture? Multiple answers are possible. In Haidom, we can do POP, yeah. We can do traction. We can do external fixation. Internal fixation is normally not done in a hospital for open fractures. Then question 14, what is the most used fixation method for open fractures in your hospital? In Haidom, I would say external fixation is mostly used for lower leg and also for the, the lower arm, the upper extremity. We do have an external fixation, that's question 15. And then we are at the end of page three. So please fill in all answers. And then you can proceed to the next page. 
So if you have external fixation, what is the brand, what is in the name or model you're using? In Heidom, I would say we have a Hoffman set available. So you can fill it in the name of your external fixation set. And then uh, the external fixation uh, is uh, coming with different parts. Are you using all parts again? We always reuse all parts, pins, clamps, bars, everything is reused. So answer here, all parts are reused in question 17. Question 18 is the fact that parts disappear with the patients a common problem. In HIDOM, we sometimes send patients back to home with a external fixation, but they normally come back and we take off the metal work later. They don't go to other hospitals because surrounding hospitals don't have equipment to take it off. So they come back to hide them. Sometimes it happens, it disappears, but it's not a common problem. How user-friendly is the external fixation operation set in your hospital? Maybe this needs a little bit of time for you to answer. You can answer the questions and you strongly disagree you are neutral, you agree, or you strongly agree with the questions. So is it easy to use? You can answer here. I think uh, the Hoffman set is quite easy to use, so I agree. Is it affecting, effective in treating open fractures? I agree. Is it always available? Most of the time we have it available, but only once a day. What are the problems, question 20, when you're using the external fixator? You can answer multiple answers again. What are the problems you face when using external fixation? Uh, maybe the set is not complete, it's not sterile, uh, different parts of different models which don't fit together, lack of instructions of how to use it, lack of trained staff to use it. It's difficult to know what pins have the adequate depth. I would say that for the Hoffman set in our hospital, otherwise no problems. How do you get feedback on the correct depth of the pin when you insert a pin in a bone? Uh, by palpation, by x-ray in the operation room, on intuition. In Hydom, I would say intuition and there are some tricks available, but we don't have x-ray in the room and you might palpate, but depending if you have a big wound effect. Question 22, do you have easy access to a manual on how to use external fixation system? We don't have a manual in HIDOM, but we are teached by others. We will come to that later. How would you characterize the manual? I'm neutral, I don't have a manual. So when you have uh, answered all questions, you can proceed to the next page. So question 24, how have you been trained to use external fixation? I was trained by colleagues, I also, Work uh, trained during workshop, also did multiple lectures on it, and I also watched some videos. Question 25, how is it finan financed in your hospital? In Heidom, the Hoffman set is donated. Then when you have answered the two questions, we proceed. Question 26, is there someone in the hospital who can perform plastic surgical flap techniques to cover exposed bones? Yes, but normally during surgical missions of foreign volunteer surgeons. So surgeons, come from abroad and they uh, provide surgical treatments together with the team of HIDOM. 
and together we can cover bone defects with flaps. Normally it's not available in high dome. Uh, if yes, which technique techniques are used? We, uh, we use a fasciocutaneous flap and also muscle flaps. We don't do free flaps in high dome normally. And this is only done normally with plastic surgeons coming from abroad. Then the last question, is there anything missing in this questionnaire that you want to share with us? Please provide your answer. Uh, here below, you can give us an example of what is missing and we'll find it. Then you can submit the questionnaire. Okay, I hope this was clear. Thank you for attending and for, sorry, for uh, sharing your vision. Now we will proceed to the next slide, to the next presentation, which is about four local flaps to cover bone defects by Dr. Botman. So yes, we continue uh, with some more uh, uh, information about the treatment. Um, I hope the uh, presentation by Dr. Hasnode was very clear. I was re really happy with it because I think it uh, absolutely uh, gave very good insight in the technique and with the very basic steps on how you can go from step to step to make a very nice and very strong um, um, uh, system that will keep your reduced bone nicely in place for good healing. Uh, it's not so difficult as you have seen, but um, it, you have to follow this, 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 these principles and then you can really reach a very good result for your, uh, for your patient. But often in open fractures, the, the problem is still there when you have reduced your fracture because the bone is still exposed. And if the bone is exposed, it will not heal. Mm, bone that is exposed is really a, good, a big problem because still bacteria can go inside, still no good vascularized tissue is there to support the bone to heal. So we're going to talk now about uh, some uh, techniques, how to deal with this exposed bone. And we go from, from basic, from simple solutions to more complex solutions. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about plastic surgery. And plastic surgery is, is about filling gaps, uh, closing wounds in general. In this situation, uh, close an open fracture. The first thing you also always have to consider is, is it possible to do primary closure of your defect? If that is easily possible, it's always the best option. Sometimes, if you're not very skilled in doing flaps, healing by secondary intention is possible. I will show an example of that but it can be really a big challenge and i will explain that as well secondary closure is sometimes possible so in the beginning you do only your debridement and later you find enough um, slack in the surrounding tissue that you can close it little by little um, techniques that are often used in plastic surgery like a, a split thickness graft or a full thickness skin graft they are not possible because if you put skin on the exposed blow bone, they can all, the skin, this skin can only survive if there's, if there's good vascularized tissue from underneath growing in this, uh, in this skin graft, but an exposed bone does not contain blood vessels that can support this, this, this skin. So the skin will die and you will, you will, you will have your, whole, your, your, your exposed bone again after a couple of days. So you need to bring good vascularized tissue with subcutaneous tissue, with muscle uh, tissue to, be, to have a good coverage of your exposed bone. So for that, to do that, you need a random pattern or an axial pattern flap. I will give some examples of that as well. In, uh, in situations where you have very advanced possibilities, then you can also do a free flap. So take some a muscle away from your upper leg, for example, and bring it down to your lower leg and attach it there to the blood vessels again. But that requires a very difficult technique and a microscope, and that is often not available in low research setting, so I'm not going to talk about it in this presentation. Mm, if you want to 
um, to, 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 to make the, 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 the exposed bone heal and to have some cover on top of it, there is one option if you really have nothing else to do. That is just keep the bone as moist as possible. If you have a healthy patient, you can be very lucky if you really be sh sure, you can really be sure that there is wet gauzes on this bone all the time and it's, it's changed often enough to, to support the, uh, the surrounding tissue to grow over the bone little by little, but it is very difficult. But it will not mean that it is impossible. It, it is something, if you have no other options, you can try to do that. Here you see an example of an exposed fracture just above the ankle joint. You see it's a really a bad old fracture, it has been neglected for some time. And we just did the first debridement here. And you still see it looks very bad with dry bone. And we were discussing amputation, shall we do it, shall we not do it, it was difficult. But at the end we decided we're going to give it a chance. We're going to fix it well, that also prevents infection. And then we're going to keep it wet as good as possible. This is a very difficult place to, to do a local flap because it just be above the ankle and that is an area where it's difficult to, to, to bring healthy tissue there. So we decided to keep it wet and to fix it. So we put an external fixator there and you, here you see after the second uh, debridement that little by little some healthy tissue is growing there again. But the bone, as you can see here, is still exposed. We continued with the wet gauzes. And we looked at the x-ray, we were quite happy with the x-ray uh, uh, um, position of the bones. And here you see, a couple of weeks later, we managed, little by little, to have the granulation tissue covering the bone. It requires antibiotics and a very good nurses that help you in the treatment on the ward. But it is possible in circumstances where nothing else is possible. That's what I wanted to show you with this example. But nature is not always that helpful. Here you see another situation. There, there was an uh, external fixation put in place to fix this, uh, this open fracture, but the soft tissue was very bad. And here you see that a big part of the bone dried out. An amputation was discussed with this patient because what else to do? How can you make the tissue grow back on the, on the bone again? And the bone is already dead. You can see it is really dry and, and, and completely dead. So we discussed this amputation, but the patient refused. So the patient stayed on the ward. And it was a bit uh, a coincidence, but one year later, I came back uh, on the ward and the patient was still there. And what did I see? It was this. You see that the, the dried dead bone was still there. But when you look at the x-ray on the back side of the bone, new bone had formed and the fracture had healed. And there was only a big uh, uh, dead piece of the bone in the front side of the leg exposed. So this is a kind of beautiful way to, uh, to show that not doing an amputation in this kind of cases in low resource setting can, can lead at the end to a good result. But it's very obvious that it needs a lot of time, more than a year time to let it heal. So what to do now? Uh, I'm going to show you four flaps for open fractures. Uh, and the four flaps for open fractures of the lower leg, they, they make the, uh, the subject a bit easier. There are much more flaps you can do, but with, with this strategy, you can find out where on the leg is your defect and what can you do for specific flaps on that specific area to uh, make the wound heal. On the upper one third of the lower leg, you have the medial gastrocnemius flap. This muscle from the back side that you can turn over to the front side to cover the exposed bone if you have a fracture there. On the middle third, you have the soleus or the hemisoleus flap that you can use to cover the bone. And there's another technique that you can use on this area and that I can show you here. That is this one, the fascio cutaneous flap and it's also called the pontan flap. You can also use propeller flaps. I can explain a bit more about that later. These are fasciocutaneous flap. So the skin with the subcutaneous tissue, and then you, uh, you, um, um, you turn it from one place of the leg to another place of the leg, but still connected to blood vessels. You must be sure you connect it to enough blood vessels to make it survive. 
On the lower part, on the close to the ankle joint, there's one other flap. I just talk briefly about it because it's a bit difficult uh, area to, to do an, uh, a flap, but you can do the reverse sewer artery flap. That's someone, something to look up on the internet uh, to see some pictures about that. But it is quite difficult uh, to do for, 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 for basic surgeons. And um, uh, that's also the reason why I showed you just before on the slides before this example of this open fracture just above the ankle where we try to do conservative treatment because this area is difficult. But a bit higher up, I can show you some examples how this fasciocutaneous flap or a soleus flap or a gastrocnemius flap, how, they, how these flaps can work. So first of all, the fasciocutaneous flap, it's called after somebody is called Pontin, but that's not really important for now. It's just the, the own name of the one who uh, described this uh, first. As you can see in this picture, you see that the blood vessels in the leg, they run in the direction of the leg. So they run in, a, in an axial pattern from above, from the proximal part to the distal part. You see here the artery and the veins running there. So that makes that you can uh, leave the, the flap connected to the body here on the proximal side. You can cut it loose all around all over this whole area and then it will still survive. And then you can use this flap to move it to the uh, defect where you need it to cover your bone. I show it in this picture where you can best use your pontent flap is here. When you take it from a part where you have muscle underneath, you can turn it over to this part where you have no muscle on top of your, uh, of, of your bone. And this is often the area where the bone is exposed because it lies just be beneath the skin. So you take this flap from here, turn it over to cover the bone here, and then on the area where you took the flap from, you can use a skin graft to put it on the muscle. And then you have the healthy, good fossilized tissue on the bone, and you have the skin graft on the muscle, and on the muscle, the skin graft can survive. I show you in this example that I showed you earlier, where you had this dead bone of this patient with this very old fracture that healed already on the back side of the bone, but this front side part was still dead. So when we left him like this, it would take another year for the body to push this dead bone out of the body and to heal. So we decided to help this patient. We decided to cut the dead piece of the bone off. And then we had exposed bone again. So we needed to cover the exposed bone. So we used this pontent flap from this lateral part of the leg where you have the muscles. And we switched over if, to cover this area here. I showed you in the, fourth, in, the first, in, the, in the next slide. Here you see it. You see here the flap. The same patient, and here you see the area where he took the flap from, and there is the skin graft placed. So this is the a very nice and not very difficult way to cover an open fracture in the middle third and the proximal third of the of the of the lower leg, and especially in the middle third, it's really nice to use this one. There are some other options. I explained that you can also use the soleus or the hemisoleus flap or a gastrocnemius flap, but our muscle flap from the calf, from the backside of the leg. I show you one example of these two muscles and because of the team of uh, Congo is also there. I worked for some time in Pokola in Congo and in the, in the, the, that's in these circumstances here. where We had one patient we, have to, we had to treat with a bad open fracture who was hunting here in the forest and uh, he, he, he badly broke his leg. And it took some time to reach the hospital and when we reached the hospital, the fracture looked like this. So on the x-ray, he had this middle uh, fracture in the middle of his, uh, of his tibia, the middle of his lower leg, but you also saw a very bad infection that was there with some animals uh, living inside. So we needed to do some debridement, some infection prevention first, and that took us some time. But after uh, a couple of debridements and a lot of rinsing with, uh, with clean water, we got the, 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 the wound clean and it looked like this. Here you see the wound a bit later. You see, we managed to get out all the animals. We get out all the dirt, but you still see some of the bone exposed. You see that it was starting to dry out. So urgently, urgently something is needed to be done. It's also not well aligned if you look at it. So the, the, the foot is, is, is completely rotated outwards 
and you see that the pieces of the bone are not well in place. So something needed to be done. So we decided, decided to take the man to theater. And in the theater, we, uh, we cleaned the bone, we, we took the dry part off, and we make it, made a nice reduction. And then we decided we needed some tissue to, uh, to, to cover this bone. So we decided to choose a muscle, and not a whole muscle, but half of the soleus muscle. And the soleus muscle is lying beneath the uh, gastrocnemius muscle on the backside, and it has blood supply from above, but also from below. So part of this muscle, we could dissect it from the backside of the leg and bring it to the front. And here you see it, that the muscle has been brought into the front of the leg to cover this exposed bone. You also see that we did not have an external fixator in these circumstances. And then my, the basic rule is, as I explained in the beginning of the presentation, follow the principles with the best possible material that you have. The principle is that you need good reduction, good coverage with healthy tissue, and the best possible, the most stable possible fixation that, is, that, that you can find. If the, if the best possible fixation is not an external fixation, but is a POP with a window, it's the best you can have, but you're still following the principles and you can still uh, achieve a very good result. The muscle, you can leave it like this, but, but it will take a long time to heal. So you need to put some skin on top of it. We did not have a dermatome at that moment to take a split skin graft. So we took a full thickness graft from the upper leg and we put it in place on top of this muscle. You can see it. We, we, we meshed it to make the, 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 sur the, the surface a bit bitter, but bigger and also to uh, let the wound uh, fluids uh, uh, come out easier and to prevent infection in that way. And it healed nicely, as you can see in this next picture. Here you see the same leg a couple of weeks later and uh, uh, it took about uh, two and a half to three months and then this, this bone was also nicely healed. And this man was able to walk again. His leg had shortened a little bit, but he was still able to walk on it and he could start hunting in the forest again. With this uh, last example, I want to explain to you that even when you are in circumstances that are not as good as here in Amsterdam, when you don't have the very good material, if you follow the principles, you can still achieve a very good result. I, I, I really believe that that's possible for everybody that is in these circumstances, uh, if they are willing and if they are uh, capable of finding the right information and if they are very motivated to use this, inf this information to be the best possible doctors in their hospital. So I really want to thank you for joining us in this uh, webinar, the first webinar of Global Surgery Amsterdam. We're going to have another uh, webinar in two weeks time about the, the role of missions, of, sur of reconstructive surgical missions. So what doctors from foreign countries can do when they assist local doctors in uh, low-income countries to uh, help them to uh, improve the patient care for this enormous burden of patients that need help when there are not enough doctors there in, the, in, 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 in their surroundings. So thanks again and hope to see you uh, back soon and have a nice evening.